Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? So thank you everyone for signing up and joining us on this weekday afternoon. So today, September 14, is a very special day both for dermatologists and our eczema patients, as today is World Eczema Day. So World Eczema Day is meant to celebrate our patients, their communities, recognize their struggles, acknowledge their triumphs, and also to share the latest developments in the treatment and management of this very common disease. So we have a lot of ground to cover in this very short one hour, with a series of three talks lined up by dermatologists from Singapore General Hospital. So first off, Professor Lee will introduce us to the patient, caregiver and doctor partnership in the treatment of atopic eczema. And then Dr. Sashen will share with us on the skincare and topical treatments in atopic dermatitis. And lastly, Dr. Karen Chu will expand on the neurotherapeutics available in atopic eczema. So we'll try to consolidate and address any questions you have at the end of the webinar, which you can type into the chat section. However, as we have had overwhelming response and registration for today's session, we like to seek your understanding in advance in the event that we might not be able to answer all of them due to time constraints. So without further ado, let me first introduce Professor Li Haoyue, who is Head of Department at our Dermatology Unit at Singapore General Hospital. So Professor Li will be sharing with us on how to tackle atopic eczema and the patient, caregiver and doctor partnership. So Dr. Li, please. Um, thanks, Laura, for the introduction, and thank you all, uh, you know, our uh, participants online. It's, it's really great to be able to share this one hour with you. So as um, what uh, Dr. Laura has shared, today is a special day because it's World Atopic Eczema Day. And it's really a day that, uh, you know, we share and then we support patients who live with atopic eczema. Um, Atopic eczema is the most common condition globally. And um, the hashtag for this year's World Atopic Eczema Day is hash if you only knew. And you know, the shared experience of all our patients is global. You know, we, we know that atopic eczema, even though it's just a skin condition, it's really much more than that. Uh, people struggle and then, the all facets of their life is affected uh, physically, socially. And with that as a, a background, I hope that over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'll be able to share, you know, some of the, the thoughts that, you know, we have and how we can really improve care of a, a topic dermatitis um, by working together as a team, the patient, the caregiver and the doctor. So atopic eczema is, first of all, it's, it's a very, very common skin condition and globally more than 200 million patients, uh, people uh, are living with AD. Um, in children, it affects about one in five and even in adults, it ranges from two to 10%. And over the last 30 years, we have seen an increase of atopic dermatitis of two to three times um, across uh, the board. So what is atopic dermatitis? Uh, it's a very common condition. Unfortunately, it's also chronic, meaning that it lasts for a, quite a while. Uh, patients often present with dry skin. Um, areas of the skin may also be red, scaly, and all of these skin uh, rashes are associated with intense itching and skin pain. Um, it starts from childhood in some patients, Whereas in others, it, it, it starts in adulthood. Uh, but even if when the eczema starts in, uh, in infancy, um, it also changes its presentation. When you're young, it starts uh, affecting mainly the cheeks and the body. And, and uh, as you uh, become a toddler or your primary school kid, then it migrates to uh, areas such as your elbows, behind the knees, the neck and the hands. The activity of, of uh, eczema varies. Um, sometimes, you know, it can be almost um, non-visible, like, uh, you know, the first top left hand. Sometimes patients may experience very bad flares, and these are maybe associated with oozing and discharge and scaling as seen on number four. And as eczema progress for a long time, sometimes they have very prominent uh, skin lines as seen in, in figure two. 
um, as you grow uh, older and uh, teenage and adulthood, sometimes your hands and feet can be uh, severely affected as well. And this really has a significant impact in um, the way we, we work and we go about with our daily activities like housework, et cetera. Um, but it's important to note that uh, each patient's journey is really unique um, and there's no a good way of you know, predicting how each one will turn out. Um, we know that the majority of patients with atopic eczema occurs before six years old. Uh, fortunately, the majority of them may clear this uh, by the time uh, they become teenagers. But there is also a small percentage of patients who develop eczema in late teens and adulthood. And we now know that there are even uh, patients who develop eczema even um, greater than 60 years old. Um, in addition to eczema, um, there is this term that we, we call atopic much. It means that uh, patients with uh, atopic eczema are at a higher risk of developing other allergic conditions such as food allergy, asthma, and allergic rhinitis, and uh, also known as you know, sensitive nose. But among all of these conditions, atopic eczema is the first one to occur. And over time, patients that may be prone or are at higher risk of developing food allergy, asthma, or sensitive nose. Um, we also know that uh, uh, you know, atopic eczema is more than skin deep. Um, in addition to all of these allergic conditions, which they're at risk for food allergy, asthma, sensitive eyes and sensitive nose, um, their skin may also be uh, prone to uh, being allergic to things that they come in contact with. And that's something we call uh, contact dermatitis. The broken skin or the broken barrier makes them prone to develop skin infections. And we know that, you know, uh, because of the symptoms and because of the appearance of the skin, many patients really uh, struggle with uh, anxiety and depression. So these are, you know, just some of the facts and figures on, on the impact of atopic dermatitis on patients. 60% uh, of patients are embarrassed by the skin more than 80% are affected significantly by the itch, um, as, as well as the pain and the stinging in the skin. 60% uh, reports of unbearable itch, more than 50% uh, reports of sleep disturbances. About a third of patients, uh, children have been teased and bullied in school. Um, patients with depression or suicidal ideation is much higher in high school uh, children with eczema. And, you know, this sort of social impact continues into adult life. You know, uh, about a quarter of them finds that their social life is affected. Um, it may also in, impact their school, work life, career progression, or even simple things that we take for granted, such as, you know, the type of clothes that we wear. So, you know, broadly, we can talk about impact of atopic dermatitis in, based on broad terms. One, I think, is the public stigmatization of atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis. You know, uh, it's a common struggle for, for many of our patients. They will say that, you know, sometimes they feel that, you know, taking the MRT, you know, other passengers are not so keen to sit right beside them. Uh, or they are embarrassed that when they stand up, there are flakes of skin that are left behind. There's also the psychological impact of symptoms and stigma uh, because you can't sleep at night. Uh, you know, it, it hinders you from close relationships uh, with others. Uh, likewise, you know, because it's a long standing condition and you may need to spend uh, significant finances on treatments, moisturizers, and notwithstanding the fact that many patients, because of their skin, they are unable to, to continue working or they need to take time off. And all of these absenteeism uh, affects, you know, finances as well. And because even though it, it just affects the patient, there's often a re ripple effect on families and caregivers. So what are some of our treatment goals that uh, we endeavor to achieve? Uh, um, um, there are two sort of broad categories and they're really interrelated. You know, as doctors, we are very good at 
looking at things, you know, what is the extent of the rash, you know, how red it is and how, how much scaling there is. But sometimes we are not so good um, at assessing other things such as the impact of the skin on your life, on itch, on sleep, on activities of daily living, mood, as well as other, you know, personal um, impacts of the individual. And I think this is when we really need to, to uh, honor the, the help from patients and their caregivers to let us know how much of your skin is uh, impacting your life or how much your skin has improved with treatment. Over the last, you know, uh, five years, we have really seen an, an increase in the number of treatments that we have for atopic eczema. In the past, you know, it used to be limited to just creams, uh, phototherapy, as well as systemic traditional treatments such as uh, yeah, immunosuppressive or, or medications that reduce your immune system, such as cyclosporin, azathioprine, methotrexate, or systemic steroids. Um, now we have a lot more options. These include biologics as well as other uh, oral medications known as JAK inhibitors. But despite you know the progress that is made um, in various studies, they have shown that uh, treatment expectations were exceeded or, or completely met only in a quarter of patients with atopic eczema. And if we just restrict to the cohort of patients with very severe eczema, um, their expectations were only met uh, in 15% of patients. So um, how can we then you know, try to improve and how can we try to bridge that gulf? And I think it's really uh, you know, a holistic approach to treating this condition and involve uh, doctors, physicians, um, together with patients and their caregivers. And I think we always need to remember that patient is really at the center point of care and, um, and it involves you know, uh, various aspects, um, education and empowerment, you know, sharing with them you know, through uh, events such as this um, to improve disease awareness, uh, having communication and trust, um, to know that uh, that what we are, uh, or that all our aims are the same, and that's really in the best interest. Uh, sharing what are some concerns, expectations, belief system, correcting misconceptions, you know, uh, providing a plan um, when things go awry. Um, um, despite the um, the wide amount of treatment that we have available. Sometimes we do not explain them, you know, adequately to patients. I think that's something that you know, doctors and caregivers need to, to know. We need to uh, be able to share, you know, what are benefits, risk, uh, what are the short and long-term benefits, um, come to decision-making in a shared uh, sort of a model, and uh, to propose the appropriate treatment for the severity. And lastly, I think we need to acknowledge that atopic eczema is really more than just a skin condition. We need to look at uh, the multiple facets, the social, the psychological impact, the other associated medical conditions, such as the allergic conditions um, that we have uh, shared earlier. And our aim is really to improve quality of life. And I think that's my last slide. And I think uh, just to... Uh, reiterate, I think together we achieve so much more and I think that's the importance of working as a team together in tackling such a uh, chronic condition. And I think with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your very insightful session. So we shall now move on to Dr. Session Afonso who is Associate Consultant Dermatologist at SGH, and he will bring us through the skin care topical treatment in the management of atopic eczema. So Dr. Session, we'll pass it on to you. Right. Thank you, Laura. 
So uh, good afternoon, everyone. In this segment, I'll take you through um, optimizing skincare and topical treatments in atopic dermatitis. As you all know, uh, topical treatment is the first line when treating atopic dermatitis, and it is what your dermatologist or your GP would have first prescribed to you. Now, effective topical therapy depends on three fundamental principles, sufficient strength, sufficient dosage, and correct application. Let's start off with the types of topical treatment. Now, to understand the topical treatment options for eczema, we need to understand exactly what we are treating. Number one, we have a defective skin barrier, which is why we use moisturizers to repair the skin barrier. Second, we have an altered immune system response, which is why we use anti-inflammatory medications like topical steroids or non-steroid alternatives. This defective skin barrier leads to increased water loss through the skin and allows microbes and other allergens to penetrate the skin. Second, we come to topical steroids potency. Now, the most commonly used anti-inflammatory topicals are topical steroids. They work through their anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive effects. Now, it's important to know, however, that not all topical steroids are equally strong. For example, we have low potency steroids on this end, like hydrocortisone, which your dermatologist may prescribe for eczema or in an area of thin skin, such as the eyelids or the face. Moderate potency steroids, like betamethasone valerate in the middle here in this diagram, which we can use for eczema on areas like the trunk. And finally, super potent steroids like clobetazole, which your dermatologist may prescribe for very thick rashes, for example, on the soles of your feet. Now, we would never use a super potent steroid like clobetazole on the eyelids, since that would cause thinning of the skin and be rapidly absorbed. Likewise, a low potency steroid would not be strong enough to penetrate a thick scaly eczema rash on an area like the feet. So, potency matters. Now, it's essential to have a very good understanding of when to apply your topical steroids. Look for signs of active inflammation. The common ones are red, scaly, itchy, or irritated skin. Apply your topical steroids twice a day to skin that shows these signs and symptoms of inflammation. Some other signs of active eczema include raised rashes that are weepy or oozy. Now, if we think of eczema as a fire, our main goal is to hit that fire as early as we can with a fire extinguisher to prevent the fire growing larger and needing the fire brigade. If we use topical steroids early, and if we use them correctly, we can then reduce skin inflammation before it worsens to the point of needing stronger or more frequent treatments. Now that we know when to apply topical steroids, let's look at how much to apply. For this, we have a very simple tool, a fingertip unit. Now, fingertip unit is described as the amount of ointment expressed from a tube with a five millimeter diameter nozzle. From this line of your skin, the distal crease all the way to the tip on the palm side of your index finger. Now, as I've shown in this diagram here, one fingertip unit of cream is enough to cover the surface area of two palms, including the fingers. Now, using the correct amount of topical steroid is important so that we have enough medication to get the desired treatment effect and to avoid over-applying the cream. Now, the next important thing is when to stop. It's important to understand when to stop topical steroids as soon as there are no signs of skin inflammation, so that we avoid any unwanted side effects like thinning off the skin. So the moment you notice that your skin is not red, not scaly, and not itchy or irritated, you can stop applying your topical steroid. I illustrated earlier that topical steroids come in various strengths or potencies, but apart from potencies, how exactly do we decide how strong an effect of a topical steroid that we need on your skin. This is where the vehicle matters. Vehicle refers to whether the steroid cream comes in a lotion, a cream, or an ointment form. As you can see here in this diagram, ointments are the most oily on the right end, and lotions are the least oily. Creams sit somewhere in between. Ointments penetrate the skin better than creams. Now your doctor will determine the right vehicle of topical steroid for your skin. When your doctor chooses an appropriate topical steroid, for instance, an ointment base is preferred for dry, scaly, and mucocutaneous lesions, for example, around the lips and genitals, 
They may use a cream for wet or oozy lesions and a liquid, for example, a solution or a lotion for hairy areas like your scalp, where the cream or ointment may not really penetrate through all those hairs to reach your skin. Areas with thin skin definitely absorb medicine more readily than areas with thick skin. The eyelids, for instance, has some of the thinnest skin on your body. So I would avoid using a very potent steroid there. The same goes for your facial skin. On the contrary, if you have hand eczema, then we're able to use a stronger steroid to penetrate the thicker skin on your hands. Finally, the site and occlusion determines how readily your medication is absorbed. So areas like skin folds, for example, your armpit, the breast fold and the groin, as well as areas that are covered up. For instance, if you wear gloves over your cream or if you apply a bandage over your cream, those retain topical medications longer with increased absorption. And in fact, sometimes we want medications to penetrate better. So we, we may even advise you to wear gloves over your creams at night before you sleep. If you were to take away one message from my slide so far, it will be these quick tips on how to safely use topical steroids. Apply steroids to the areas of inflamed skin, use a fingertip unit to measure the correct amount of cream, stop when there are no more signs of inflammation or no signs of symptoms of skin inflammation, and most importantly, ask your dermatologist which creams to apply to which areas of your body. That information is crucial. Now, steroids are not the only treatment options we have to treat skin inflammation. If you're not keen to use topical steroids or for some reason are unable to use topical steroids, then we have two other treatment options. These are topical calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus and pimacrolimus over here, as well as topical phosphodiesterase inhibitors like crisoberol. I thought I'd also share some very quick tips on skincare. Here are some seven simple tips to washing your face. So start off with a gentle non-abrasive cleanser, wet your face with lukewarm water using just your fingertips, avoid scrubbing your skin as this can become more rough, rinse with lukewarm water, pat dry, not rub dry, using a soft towel, apply your moisturizer, and I often recommend people to keep a moisturizer within your bathroom next to the shower so that you can get it on as soon as possible, and limit washing your face to twice a day and after sweating. Now you can apply similar principles to when you wash your body, using a gentle cleanser, using cooler water and keeping your shower time short. Finally, remember that atopic dermatitis is a disease where there is a defective skin barrier. And to repair the skin barrier, we need to use moisturizers. As, ask yourself, is this moisturizer effective? For instance, thicker, drier areas may benefit from a more oily ointment like white soft paraffin. There's a wide range and variety of moisturizers available at every price point, so choose one that is within your budget. Consider the size of application, how easy it is to apply. For instance, at home, you might prefer a moisturizer that comes in a pump bottle, and on the go, you might like a small tube to fit in your bag. Safety is important, so be mindful when applying oily moisturizers on the soles of your feet to avoid slipping. But ultimately, the best moisturizer is one that is within your budget, easy to apply, and therefore one that you will constantly use consistently. So we've gone over topical steroids and moisturizers with some quick and effective tips, and I hope that's been helpful for you. Thank you. Thank you, Session, for your very insightful talk. A lot of polls and a lot of gems shared with the public over here. So um, now we'd like to introduce um, Dr. Karen Chu, who is a consultant dermatologist at Singapore General Hospital, and she'll be going through the newer treatments in atopic dermatitis and their roles and, and uh, management options. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak at this webinar. I just want to check that the sound and everybody can see my slides. Thank you. Okay, so I have the privilege to talk about newer treatments in atopic dermatitis and who should receive them and where 
uh, where does it come in in the treatment regime for patients with atopic dermatitis? So what's the plan? In the next 10 minutes, we hope to go, go through what is atopic dermatitis. My colleagues, Dr. Lee and Dr. Shashen has gone through a little bit. What causes it? And from there, how can we tackle eczema or atopic dermatitis and a personalized plan for you and what to expect in your dermatology consult? So first of all, what is atopic dermatitis? We already know that's characterized by dry, red, and itchy inflamed skin. It can look different on various uh, different individual, as Dr. Lee has shared. Sometimes it can look like leather, dry, thick skin, or it can look um, like the picture at the bottom um, with red, with crust and dry and itchy and red skin. We know that one in 10 um, uh, individuals uh, in Singapore suffer from atopic dermatitis, so it's quite common. And we also know that it's chronic, meaning it will be for months and years, and it's relapsing, remitting. There are good days and there are bad days. And we know that eczema is a problem of skin. Now, before we go into how do we tackle um, atopic dermatitis apart from topicals, I'd just like to introduce you uh, to the skin. Our skin, there's three layers. At the top, there's the epidermis. And the second, there's the dermis. And the third layer is the hypodermis. Now, eczema is a problem of the first two layers of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis. What happens is that somebody with eczema, they will have defective skin barrier. And uh, in the second layer of the skin, there's some skin inflammation. And environmental as well as behavioral um, uh, or habits, such as scratching, may make it worse. And we'll go through each of this. So imagine your top layer of the skin. A normal person or a patient without eczema should, their top layer of the skin should look like a normal brick wall. Each brick is nice and plump and the cement is well cemented. The wall is painted with a protective layer of paint. As, as a result, uh, they seldom get infected and the moisture is kept within the skin. The problem with patients with eczema is that in a lesional skin where there's eczema, the bricks are, which represents individual skin cells, they are crumbly, they are, they are so dry, and they tend to break off. The cement in between uh, is not intact. And we've heard from Dr. Shashen that the way to repair this is to use moisturizer. Now, we also know because we shower daily in Singapore, whenever we shower, we wash off this um, oil that we've put on of, as moisturizer. Therefore, we need to put the habit of applying it back regularly. And if you can repair your skin barrier from a crumbly brick wall to that of a normal brick wall, then you have essentially restored back the healthy skin barrier. So I put that at the top of my diagram. What about the next one, which is skin inflammation? Now, I we, this analogy has been referred to or uh, described by Dr. Lee, and I'd like to bring this description a little bit further. Now, inflammation to me is like fire. It can be very bad. For example, a forest fire in severe, whippy, red, hot, itchy, eczema. Or it can be mild, like embers, you know, after a barbecue when the eczema is mild and all you need is topical treatment and that'll be better. But like fire, if you don't get it controlled, it will spread. Sadly, there are things in the environment and things that we do that can make our skin inflammation worse. This is my picture to show the wind because wind, you know, can make forest fire worse. So example with stress, stress can make eczema worse. And of course, um, uh, fire fuel like wood can also um, worsen a forest fire. And I equate that to, for example, scratching or irritation, skin irritation. Now, if there's a forest fire, you actually need a hose. So you need something strong to get rid of all the things. Otherwise, you will leave pockets of fire that can then spread. And you might get frustrated thinking your, your treatment is not effective. But actually, it's you haven't managed to control the inflammation. And we will go through later the options that we can use to control this inflammation. If you attempt to use buckets of water to quench a forest fire, chances are you it will be unsuccessful. So I 
this is similar of, to trying to use mild topical steroids um, or just moisturizer alone for those of us who are fearful uh, about the side effect of topical steroids to try to quench severe inflammation. It's not going to work. Now, this slide I know is busy and it, um, um, it's essentially to show that in the second layer of skin, there are many cells of our immune system that's activated. We might not be able to see it with the naked eye, but on the surface of the skin, we can see inflammation. So, and that's why when you come to see a doctor or a dermatologist, we will need to examine your skin and uh, to look at the degree of inflammation. And some of this medication that I'll talk about later targets this inflammation cells. Now, inflammation can look different on different types of skin. We spoke about the leathery skin in our, my earlier slide and the um, flexural eczema, the knee flexures here in the first picture. But it can also look like the second picture where you have weeping, you have crust, you can even have skin pain. And this is a picture of discoid eczema. Or in the third picture is also another form of eczema called pomphalix or dyshydrotic eczema, where you can have very itchy, uh, small, but water bubbles on the sole of the foot. Now, all these are caused by inflammation in the first and second layer of the skin. So how do we use inflammation? How can we tackle? Now, the way to do it is to address each uh, angle of the triangle. We need to use a moisturizer to repair the defective skin barrier and restore it. We will need moisturizer steroids, topical anti-inflammation to reduce skin inflammation. And hopefully in the next section of my slide, I'll also be talking to you about oral medication as well as infection. And at the same time, if we can identify any infection, we will need to treat that. If there's any allergens like house dust mites, we will need to avoid it. Uh, and if there's stress, we will need counseling and support. And we do have the the of our psychologist uh, that's attached to our clinic at SGH. But how has the treatment uh, evolved over the years? Back in 1950, um, we only had oral and or injectable st steroids. We don't use that nowadays. 20 years down the road, we started to have phototherapy. Then we have oral systemic immune modulating drugs. Protopic came about in the year 2000. And in the last five to seven years, we have a newer medication. They are called biologic and small molecules. Don't worry, I will go into details about all this treatment. But I want to point out that we don't use oral injectable steroids anymore because of the side effects uh, that they, they um, the, as a consequence of using them in the long term. So if we have better treatment now with the less or better side effect profile that we can discuss um, yeah, should you need it. So this is my treatment pyramid that I frequently uh, draw or discuss with uh, my patient. Um, the color code is supposed to, to correspond to the triangle that I showed you earlier, uh, the, the cost, for example. Everyone, the pyramid um, lies on the base of where we will need to modify uh, our lifestyle. For example, if you're smoking, that may make eczema worse. Um, to modify our behavioral, or there will be a education on skin care. Then we need to repair the skin with moisturizer and topical treatment. And my colleague, Dr. Shashin, has gone in uh, greater details uh, in the earlier talk. And I'm actually going to talk about the top of the pyramid where we discuss things like phototherapy, things like systemic immune modulating drugs and biologic and small molecule. But I apologize. But where do we draw the line? Who gets what? So I think for those of us who suffer from moderate severe eczema, where in the context of a forest fire where we need a fire hose and lots of water, we probably need to start thinking about the top of the pyramid. Whereas if your eczema is mild, then you are only having embers or uh, um, mild grumbling fire, you probably could get away with just using topical treatment and moisturizer. 
So first, what is light treatment? Now I can tell you that it's not a new concept. Um, other treatment use it too. And I put a small picture where, where a baby who has jaundice is going through light treatment. So we use the same concept in treating eczema where we use a narrow band of the sunlight um, to reduce skin inflammation um, for those with eczema. Um, usually this treatment is uh, conducted two to three times a week and most of the major hospitals in Singapore will have such, uh, such treatment available. The good thing about this is that it's external therapy. There are no medication that are consumed. When we talk about systemic immune modulating drugs, what a mouthful. So, so let me first describe what they are. Uh, they are medication that helps with the immune system that cause inflammation. Okay, let's reverse a little bit back. All of us, we have a functioning immune system. Our immune system uh, will help us fight bacteria and virus. That's what the picture shows. But we know that patients with eczema, their immune system is overreactive, especially in the skin. And that's what caused them to have red, itchy, and dry skin. We also know that we've talked about this and given you the analogy of a fire for inflammation. So systemic immune modulating drugs are actually medication that dampens down this overactive immune system for patients with eczema. However, we will need to monitor side effects because this medication are not very specific. They don't just dampen down the uh, immune system in the skin, but they also dampen down the immune system everywhere else. As a result, you may be more prone to infection if you're on some of this medication. And the examples are medication like cyclosporine, methotrexate, and azathioprine. Therefore, if if you choose, or uh, if you and your doctor think this, this option is suitable for you, we will usually journey with you. There will be monitoring of, uh, uh, of your skin and uh, uh, improvement, the rate of improvement. We will also be looking at side effects and to, and to see to where we can titrate the dose that's best suit you. But remember, in the last five to seven years, we have newer medication and they are called biologics and oral mole um, small molecules. They also work on the, our immune system. This is the same picture to show that our immune system is functioned to protect us from bacteria, viruses, etc. And we know that there's a, uh, in patients with eczema, the immune system is overactive but unlike the traditional systemic immune modulating drugs, biologic and small molecules, they actually intercept um, the communication line between all these cells. You can see from my diagram, one cell talk to the other. It's a little bit like um, fake news spreading around. So biologics and small molecules, they actually intercept so that the fire don't spread as much and it can then, the information can then be dampened down. We have biologics that are injectable as well as small molecules that are oral medication. Now, does that mean if it's so specific that it only acts on the communication between the cells in the skin, are there any side effects? Yes, they do. But generally, these side effects are safer because they target they are more targeted um, and they only affect the immune system of the skin. So these are the examples that's available in Singapore. But more important, who, what treatment is best for someone with eczema? We're talking about personalized care. Now, when you see a doctor, um, whether it's your uh, dermatologist, um, First thing we do is to assess your skin. Now, some may not even be eczema. Now, if it's not eczema, then you may not respond very well to the treatment for eczema. So we will, we will review um, your skin and we will make sure that our diagnosis is accurate. Then there will be some of us who will respond with topical treatment only. For example, those with just mild eczema. Sometimes we may need to add behavioral therapy, especially when there's a lot of stress that trigger this eczema. Or we might add phototherapy if we think this is a suitable option for you. 
or biologics or small molecule or systemic immunosuppressants. Now, the problem is, how do we know who needs what? And this is typically the, our assessment when we see someone with eczema in, the, in our dermatology clinic. We first want to talk to you. We want to know what's your history. We examine your skin to make sure that we are still looking at eczema. We want to know the impact of your condition or atopic dermatitis on your sleep, on your relationship, on your work, on your studies. We will then talk to you about your general health. Is your gen Based on your general health, can your body um, be subjected to the side effects that we've described for systemic immunomodulating drugs or to biologics or small molecule? Is the treatment something that is sustainable, affordable? Is it convenient for you to come for follow-up? And there may be some of our patients who are going through the stage of life where they're thinking about starting a family and the treatment selection may differ. Now, once we have decided on the treatment, then we need to know what stage that we say, okay, this we have achieved what we want to achieve. Now, these treatment goals are usually set together with the patients, like a partnership. Um, Dr. Lee has spoken about it earlier. It could be... Um, how good, how well your skin has responded. Uh, we may not want to see uh, lesions of eczema, but it could also be lifestyle goals. I have patients who tell me, doctor, I just want to be able to sleep or I want to be able to work. And I have one who told me, I want to have a girlfriend. So that may be some treatment goals we can set. Then we would look at the speed of response as well as whether it's sustainable. When we look at long-term monitoring, we add every medication, we are looking at side effects, but we're also looking at how beneficial for you and whether we should continue the same medication or switch. And I think these are the things that you can expect in the eczema clinic consult. I think this is my last slide. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karen. Uh, for the for your talk earlier, so um, we've tried to address um, quite a few of the questions. We've got many of them in the Q and A box. Uh, remember to put them in the Q and A box instead of the chat uh, section, um, and we'll address uh, the first one live first. Okay. So the first question. Is it possible to develop atopic dermatitis as a young adult or even in midlife? Some diet, uh, okay, as in, uh, sounds like the patient has been trying to control their diet, but they still get flare ups of their eczema. So there are quite a few um, questions on uh, developing atopic eczema in adulthood or later in life. Um, does any one of our speakers uh, like to address this question? Um, yeah, I think I can, I can uh, take this one. So I think it's, you know, we tend to think that the atopic eczema is, is really a condition that affects um, babies, infants, and young children. And uh, certainly, I think the bulk of patients are going to be uh, children, or at least develop in children. But we know that a significant proportion of patients do develop eczema as a young adult, or even in midlife, or even in, in old age. Um, um, although we, you know, it's popular, you know, and or, or, although it's, you know, many people tend to associate diet with eczema, however, you know, it's not been um, the experience, particularly in adults. Um, in children, there is some, there might be some association with food allergies, but typically with uh, middle age or adult uh, onset eczema, there has not been any strong association with diets. And I think um, that's why, you know, we have uh, experiences like this where, you know, despite controlling your diet, it doesn't actually um, prevent uh, atopic eczema flares. Thank you, Prof. Lee. Uh, so this actually also leads on to quite a few other questions that we had regarding, you know, uh, food 
uh, as a trigger for eczema, which we can further address later. Um, the next question would be, um, yeah, so it's the same thing. So um, if a patient gets eczema later in their age, um, so in adulthood, uh, what are the main triggers? So is there um, like a genetic inheritance? Is it caused by COVID vaccines, which um, was also another question that um, someone asked, uh, whether eczema is contagious. Um, so essentially, what are the triggers la, of eczema and how do they get that in adulthood or midlife as opposed to as a child? Uh, Dr. Karen or Dr. Session? I think I can take the question whether it's related to COVID vaccine. Yeah, okay. So the vaccine itself, when someone gets a vaccine, it activates your immune system. And sadly, if you have an active, overactive immune system, as I explained to you earlier, for somebody with eczema, when the vaccine activates your immune system, because that's what vaccine is supposed to do, for you to develop antibody, you need the immune system to be activated. It will also activate the skin immune system. As a result, you might unmask or worsen those already with eczema. It doesn't directly cause it. So you might not be allergic to the vaccine, but the vaccine may make it worse or unmask it. So in the past, you may have very mild eczema where the vaccine has become worse. The treatment is still the same like what we, we explained. So you could use topical creams that, as the Dr. Shashen's um, advice. Um, and if it's uh, moderate or severe, you might need to use the things that I've talked about. So that's the thing about vaccination. Thank I will probably address the second part also. Is it contagious uh, and can it spread? Um, the short answer is no, because it's actually your immune system. Your immune system belongs to you. It doesn't spread to the other person. Um, it's not contagious, doesn't spread, but it can be genetically inherited. Meaning, if your parent had eczema, if one parent had eczema, there's 40% chance of the child getting it, two parents, the chances goes up. So in that manner, you can inherit eczema, and therefore more than one person in the family may suffer from it, but you don't, you don't spread eczema and it's not contagious. I hope that reassures you. So thank you, Dr. Karen. Yes. So we do know that eczema is definitely not contagious. And then we've addressed the one about the COVID vaccine that I think most uh, people are very concerned about. So this um, then carries on from the first question as well regarding food um, and that being a trigger for eczema, especially in Singapore and an Asian con context. Um, we get a lot of these questions from our patients. So, um, so asking um, an 11 year old girl started having eczema since seven years of age and, and it keeps coming back. Is there any food that we should avoid? Um, so I can take this. So I think in general, you know, it is not uh, advocated to um, food restrict uh, because actually, uh, you know, by restricting the nutrition, it sometimes you do more harm than, than uh, improve the eczema. And we know that this is particularly important in the childhood and in pediatric populations where they are still growing and they need all the nutrients to, to grow. Um, so, you know, I, I think unless there is something that is very clear that it is a uh, food allergy and sometimes we need more tests such as skin prick tests or, or blood tests to evaluate in children. Um, otherwise, you know, we shouldn't be just uh, avoiding foods uh, with the aim of trying to avoid or, or treat eczema. The next question, thank you, Dr. Lee. How do we avoid getting eczema? <laughs> uh, so uh, really boils down, I hope everyone um, has uh, listened to our talk. So it really boils down to um, all the skincare topicals and avoiding the triggers. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Sash, do you want to, do you like to answer this? Thanks, Laura. So as I mentioned in my presentation, so eczema is because of, there are two things in the underlying pathophysiology you have a skin barrier. So it's almost like roof tiles that are not put together well. 
and you have inflammation. So like Dr. Karen mentioned, it's your immune system. So some families tend to have eczema. Some people with asthma and allergies tend to be more likely to get eczema. But once you, in those cases, we actually can't change our genetic predisposition. We may have gotten certain genes that put us at higher risk to getting eczema. But although we can't take care of the genes, there's so many ways to prevent our skin from flaring up. So good skin care, avoiding any triggers, for example, uh, stress, hot weather, sweating, wearing uh, the right kind of fabric, even cotton, more breathable fabric to minimize your triggers and knowing which creams to apply when. So studies have actually showed that even uh, using moisturizers more frequently to control your eczema would lead to less use of topical steroids. So ultimately it comes down to knowing your body, knowing what triggers it and using the right creams. Thank you, Sesh. So yes, do consult a dermatologist for more information. Um, I think we have quite a lot of other questions on the Q&A section that we're trying to answer as well. Um, so this one would be the next one, which would be some of the side effects of using steroids. Um, so this would be, I guess, pertinent to topical steroids or systemic kind of oral steroids use. Um, I guess uh, Dr. Sesh can address the ones with the topical steroids use. Yes, definitely. So um, like I mentioned, uh, steroids are actually one of the mainstays applied topically to, your, uh, to management of eczema. However, uh, I mentioned those tips because it's important to use them correctly, which means using them exactly where you need it for the shortest period of time that is required. So not under treating, but not over treating either, because if used correctly, there aren't, they're actually very safe. However, there are cases where patients have used topical steroids incorrectly. Just the other day, I was reading a paper about um, these parents in China who had been using a cream and they noticed that all their kids were getting puffy cheeks and hairy cheeks. And this alarm, there was a big epidemic of this. Further analysis showed that this cream actually had clobetasol. You remember in my slide, I showed that clobetasol was a super potent steroid. Now, if a super potent steroid is applied all over the body, there will be some absorption into the bloodstream and it can cause side effects. So incorrect use of a steroid for example, over the entire body or for a very long time without the advice of your doctor or your dermatologist can cause things like thinning of the skin, easy bruising, some increased hair growth on that area. Uh, when you have systemic absorption, meaning absorption into the blood, it can st slowly start to have effects of, you know, the same effects as tablet steroids. For example, if you use a very strong steroid around the eyes, it could even cause, um, contribute towards glaucoma. But all of these have to be weighed against the benefits of steroids. So if you use it responsibly, you would not have these side effects. Uh, just to add to that, Laura, um, some people may actually, just like any medications which you may be allergic to, some people find that they actually may be sensitive to some of the ingredients in steroids. They actually may have a contact dermatitis or an allergy to steroids. Now that's um, not really a side effect, but it's uh, a possible reaction that some patients have. And in this case, they should con uh, contact their dermatologist, consult them, and then use another agent. Thank you, Sash. So um, I guess this brings us to our, our next question. Uh, can a mixture of moisturizer and steroids be used long-term? Um, so this is, again, individualized and would be dependent on a lot of uh, patient factors. Um, as well as uh, moisturizer and steroid factors in terms of what it contains and uh, treatment of what condition. Um, anyone would like to answer this one? Sesh? Yeah, so uh, to address this, um, any good thing, even, even, even the best thing, for example, say a fire, you let it go out of control, it cause it burns your house down. So similarly, using a mixture of topical steroids and moisturizer should, if something like that, so it should be always in consultation with your dermatologist. Generally, what we would recommend is we apply the steroid and then apply your moisturizer. So your dermatologist will be the best person to advise you case by case. So it would not be safe to use long-term uncontrolled without any guidance. 
from a dermatologist. Thank you, Sash. Um, so uh, I think we have time for one last question. So uh, perhaps we will answer the one on um, biologics and small molecules. Um, so um, an anonymous attendee asks, can you tell us more about the types of biologics and small molecules treatment and what are the side effects short and long term? Uh, perhaps Dr. Karen or Dr. Lee would like to help us with this. Hey. Uh, can I share screen? Okay, let me try, try, okay? I actually prepare slides for this. Can you see my screen? So the question is what op what options we have right now, right? Okay, okay. So um, currently, Dupixin is um, um, licensed in Singapore for the treatment of severe eczema, um, or Dupilumab is actually the drug name. Dupixin is the brand name. Um, is an injection that uh, that requires to be given every two weeks. It's got a fast onset weeks and you can you can potentially be on it from months to years of course with every medicine there's always side effects but not 100 percent of patients will, will get side effects so about one in five may experience some injection side reaction some headache uh, conjunctivitis nasal pharyngitis and worsening facial eczema are, are the side effects that i do counsel so that's well uh, an example of a biologic then we have a small molecule, which um, uh, the genus kinase inhibitor or JAK inhibitor in short. Uh, we have three types in Singapore. We have Simbigo, which is abrocitinib, Rivonc, which is upadacitinib, and Olumium, which is baricitinib. Now, these are oral tablets, so you can avoid injecting yourself. And they do work very fast. Um, and we, we can potentially be on it for up to a year. And their side effect profiles um, have uh, increased risk of infection, nausea, headache, nasal pharyngitis, raised muscle enzyme, acne. But the main key point that I wanted to uh, share is that um, we will need to match it. Everybody will, um, we, we will need to match the medication to the patient. So it's not something that we will say, um, okay, if you get it, you're going to get Dupixin. If you come to us, we're going to give you Dupixin. Or we come to us, we're going to give you um, uh, JAK inhibitors. When you come to us, we will assess and we will see what stage of your eczema it is. Um, the, can your, can your, the rest of your health, can your body um, be suitable for this medication or not? Um, does the lifestyle that you lead fit um, the type of medication? Um, that, that we are recommending. And nothing is fixed in stone. Every review that you come, we are revisiting. Then any side effects, is it effective? So the main key point here is it's not a one size fits all. Um, we, when you come, we are tailoring your treatment for you. So it's important that you come and it's important that we discuss all this during the clinic consult. I hope that's clear. Thank you, Dr. Karen. Yeah, we agree. <laughs> um, so the, I, I think we try our best to address as many questions um, as we could for today. I'd like to thank all the three speakers, so Professor Lee, Dr. Session, and Dr. Karen, for all their very good talks. Um, we appreciate if everyone can uh, scan the QR code for a survey, um, as well as um, fill out our feedback form later. And uh, thank you everyone for attending and taking your precious lunch time out to um, listen to our webinar.